Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Tech Talk. Uh, this year we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of EOS and we have a very special guest with us here today, uh, our founder of EOS, uh, Dr. Langer. Thank you for joining us this week, Dr. Langer. Thank you. So my first question is what kept you motivated to hold on to additive manufacturing over the years? I think you had to tackle many, many challenges. I think a lot of challenges, but a lot of chances. And uh, to tell you the truth, every day a new chance. <laughs> so uh, as long as things are going in a very positive way, mm -hmm. I think this is, uh, keeps me motivated. And Dr. Langer, as a, as a pioneer of this technology, you were one of the first doing this and working with additive manufacturing. Um, who were your role models back then when you started EOS? And, and who did you draw inspiration from? And so, before I started the US, I was working for a company called Generous Ken. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, and we are now back in the mid 80s, uh, Generous Kenning had a quasi monopoly on, on laser positioning equipment. Mm -hmm. So our customers were starting to play with additive. The most famous one was Jack Hall, the founder of 3D Systems. Uh, but not only he, a lot of research labs mm -hmm. in worldwide, as it started in the States, Japan, Europe, uh, people started to look into layer manufacturing, mm -hmm. so making parts layer by layer. Our very first application in, in plastic mm -hmm. uh, were blood centrifuges, and, uh, and this was in the mid 90s. Uh, it was my neighbor, more or less, who had this uh, company making these blood centrifuges. And I showed him EOS uh, 95, and the guy was 75 years old mm -hmm. at this point in time. Uh, and he looked at our technology and said, he wants to buy a machine. And I said, hey, uh, did you really think about what to do with it? And mm -hmm. he thought about it. And at the end of the day, what he did is, his blood centrifuges normally consisted of around 30 three zero injection molded parts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he put all these parts in one. And therefore he could get rid of tooling, which was the most expensive part mm -hmm. in his product design. He established in uh, 98 mm -hmm. the first digital factory by just uh, introducing 3D CAD and then uh, taking inventories away and taking tooling away and this is what they are still doing. A lot of inspiration then from, from the application side, right? Yeah. So a lot of inspiration from the customers. Yeah. When you started with the technology, was there one particular industry in mind where you thought these machines that we're creating are really going to help in this particular industry? Yes, because uh, when we had started EOS, uh, people that had no idea what the technology is. Normally you go to a party, you meet a new person mm -hmm. and uh, they ask you, what are you doing? So I had to think about uh, some understandable applications, mm -hmm. uh, which made also for the others a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, I picked just medical. Mm -hmm. I said, with our technology, you can make spare parts for your body. You start with your teeth, you go to special bones mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and you just make replacements or if you have an accident you need uh, some uh, special parts mm -hmm. of your body to be repaired and this is what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And everybody was very excited and understood immediately. Mm -hmm. And yeah. therefore I think medical is a, is, a, is a key application just from this point of view and everybody can understand mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah, I think the, the customization really fits yeah. in well with the additive manufacturing and medical. What about for the future? So what kinds of industries are you hoping that we can really make an impact in in the future? Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, in principle, I think there are nearly all industries mm -hmm. uh, that are affected by our technology. Mm -hmm. And when I look today, I think one of the most important uh, uh, advantages our technology has is that we can integrate functions. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, take a rocket engine. I mean, these engines sometimes have several hundred parts mm -hmm. and uh, we have a real uh, chance to integrate all these parts in one or a few of them and then uh, we are changing the industry 
not so much that we can make the parts, mm -hmm. but it's a revolution in terms of quality assurance. Mm -hmm. uh, today, quality assurance uh, in specific markets is more expensive than making the parts. Mm -hmm. And by doing uh, this additively, it could be just the opposite. Mm -hmm. So we have to look, and I think the most important thing is to look from an additive point of view. So not try to improve a conventional part, mm -hmm. because this is probably not the way we should look at it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you can make something conventional, you should do it conventional. Mm -hmm. But if you can't do it conventional, then it becomes interesting for us. So let's, let's talk about <laughs> R&D and uh, let's also talk about the early stages. So you started with stereolithography and I'm curious uh, to know um, what was your motivation to discontinue with this technology and to start with the two laser bed, a laser based part of it fusion technologies for metals and polymers? It's very simple. Uh, we started with stereolithography uh, because this was technology we could handle at this point in time. But our customers said from day one, they do not only want a prototyping technology, mm. they want a manufacturing technology. Mm. And it was very clear that stereolithography would not be able to do this. Not functional enough from mm. a parts point of view. Okay. So therefore, as a logic, uh, we uh, moved into the uh, first plastic sintering and then metal sintering world, it was a request of our customers to come up with functional parts. And uh, this put us in a very advantageous position because uh, in 93 uh, we, uh, we got uh, patent litigation mm -hmm. from our plastic competitors and we were able to uh, fix patent litigation to settle in just uh, giving up uh, stereolithography when we didn't need it anymore. Okay, okay. And now I'm also curious to know um, if you can name some of the challenges in developing this kind of machines. I think the, the biggest challenge was from day one, uh, it was the, the, the enormous tensions you build up in these parts. Mm -hmm. So when you do layer by layer, uh, in, uh, in powder it's more extreme mm. uh, than in liquid because in powder you start with a density of typically 50% mm -hmm. of the material mm -hmm. just because you have powder and there is air between the powder mm -hmm. particles. Mm -hmm. And out of this 50% you want to get a nearly 100% dense part and you know, I mean you have to get rid of this uh, air bubbles in between mm -hmm. and this means you have uh, an enormous amount of shrinkage in your material that leads to an enormous amount of uh, tension in the part. And this was the problem from day one. As when we took the order from BMW to develop the stereolithography machine, we could not imagine how much trouble this would be on the material side. Mm -hmm. So the machine for us, we were coming out of the laser industry machine building side was rather easy, but this process, mm -hmm. the materials, this was extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we managed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the solution was software, mm -hmm. was beam positioning. Mm -hmm. So we developed a software where more or less not the whole area was illuminated in one step. Mm -hmm. It was just in a very intelligent way. So we made more or less islands mm -hmm. within, uh, within the surface mm -hmm. and then connected these islands. And by doing this, it's like when you build a bridge and you have uh, uh, distance between the different plates of concrete. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise the bridge would uh, break uh, when temperature is changing. And so we did it this way. And, okay. uh, and it's very important to understand that uh, the material issue it's not really a material issue, it's a software issue. Mm -hmm. So you come up with a software solution to make material usable mm -hmm. in the process. And this is still true today. Mm -hmm. And this will be key of the future. Yeah, so and uh, what potentials like in terms of light engines and as you already named like materials like for example digital materials, do you see like uh, very big potentials for the future. I think this is exactly the concept. Yeah. So you take a material uh, in form of powder and then you take the laser 
to melt it. Mm -hmm. And during the melting process, you create a totally new material. Also we can make, for instance, out of an aluminum powder, mm -hmm. uh, a part with the strength of steel. Yeah. This is impossible with uh, standard aluminum. So you create simply through the process a new material, and therefore I call it a digital material, yeah. mm -hmm. because it is not available in nature. Mm. Then you can go into these different applications and you will find a lot of digital materials uh, because normally simply by using a different software to uh, illuminate mm. the part or to melt the powder, you are creating every day uh, a lot of new materials, material properties. And this is endless. Mm. This is endless. And, and therefore, I think uh, the basic understanding that we do not need a material like in a conventional process with a specific uh, um, uh, performance, uh, I think this is a, a key mindset we have to change. Yeah. Because normally the designer is looking for aluminum powder when he wants to have an aluminum part. But it could be that he doesn't need aluminum for an aluminum part, mm -hmm. as he does not need uh, steel for a steel part. Yeah. So he only asks us about the properties, and right. then. So and, and this is uh, the major problem, uh, and uh, and there is another problem. Uh, it starts with design, mm -hmm. because where uh, is our technology appropriate mm -hmm. compared to conventional? technologies. Mm -hmm. And I always uh, look into the nature. So you look at a blossom, mm -hmm. the blossom. How is the blossom created? Mm -hmm. It's not cut, it's not drilled, it's not sued, it's it just grows. Mm -hmm. So if you have a software that knows on how these parts are growing or have to be grown, mm -hmm. then you have a solution. And by the end of the day, this is probably not a human property mm. you can develop. Mm. You have to ask the computer yeah. how to do this. So, and, uh, and I'm very glad that we were able to present this to the public mm -hmm. just recently. Uh, parts just designed by a computer with the algorithms in the back how nature would do this. Mm -hmm. And we are using this in a very specific mm -hmm. case for rocket engines. It's optimization. Yeah. Um, problem and you can solve it at a factory. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this opens uh, space for another 10 to 20 years uh, uh, where we have, will be busy in, in this direction. But people start to understand mm -hmm. that this is where we are. At uh, Edith Manufacturing now we have this transformation to, to the mass. It's a mass production technology, so how do you see this will come so in the, be, be in the future? Be careful, we do not transfer it to a mass technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, additive will always be a niche, mm -hmm. also much smaller than conventional manufacturing. I say uh, a maximum of 5% mm -hmm. we can do additive. But we do additive just what you cannot do conventional. And I think this is important. Mm -hmm. Also when I have a CTO of a manufacturing company uh, in front of me and he asked me, what should we do with editing? Mm -hmm. Then I always tell him, mm -hmm. just tell me what you can't do conventional. And think about this. And normally they take a few minutes, uh, 10, 20 minutes, but typically a CTO of a manufacturing company uh, come back within less than half an hour mm -hmm. about three areas what they cannot do mm -hmm. conventionally. This is a starting point for us. Okay, and uh, so my last question would be then now we are celebrating the 30th anniversary, so how do you see the next 30 years for US and I, AM? I look normally in five year hmm. uh, periods. I mean we are used now to cast things, we are used to our conventional production methods. But I think uh, when you keep in mind that uh, additive is a digital technology and it's digital scalable. And we are working with companies that uh, build future manufacturing platforms at their headquarters with the goal to introduce 
this manufacturing process as an app, as an app mm -hmm. in their digital factories worldwide. As it's not unusual that there is a headquarter and they have a hundred manufacturing places worldwide. Mm -hmm. And we are talking to people that say, okay, in the past when we developed a new application in conventional manufacturing, mm -hmm. then it took us years to transfer this to our manufacturing places mm -hmm. in the world. And the target today is to do it in a week. So you develop this uh, at a special headquarter and then you make sure within a week that this process is implemented in production. Mm. With additive this is possible simply because it's strictly digital. So it's fully scalable. And the scalability of this, this is the most important element in the whole process mm. we have digital materials, we have digital design, and we have digital processes. And if you combine this, there is no other technology in manufacturing world that has a comparable advantage to be multiplied and scaled up. Do you, do you see this as a big barrier where people um, have all of this experience with casting or with machining and they just don't have the the data to back up the additive manufacturing, do you see that as, as a barrier that we're facing right now? I think it's mindset. Mm -hmm. It's mindset, it's not database. I have a lot of hope that if we can use not only man, but computers mm -hmm. uh, for the design, mm -hmm. then this will change the game because men are normally too slow to, to adapt these kind of new technologies. Mm -hmm. like. Uh, Artificial intelligence, I mean, the computer learns how to play chess, the computer has learned how to play Go, mm -hmm. the computer will have learned how to design for additive. Mm -hmm. And if it does it in the right way, the limiting point is no longer the designer that doesn't know how to use our technology. So, thank you very much, thank Dr. Lager, for this very interesting talk, and uh, I think we can. We can be really, really excited to see what future brings for additive manufacturing and also for US. So stay tuned and thanks for watching.